Hello class, Professor Dwight Hughes for the Clark College in Tech 222 course. This is Chapter 9, NAT for IPv4. Okay, we're going to look at three things. We'll take a look at network layer protocols and explain how NAT works with them in a small to medium sized network. We'll configure NAT, go over the commands and how you get NAT working, and then we'll troubleshoot some NAT configurations to finish up. All right, let's talk about the theory NAT operation. NAT was created as one of three mechanisms to extend the life of the IPv4 address space. So we added uh, the idea of variable length subnet mass or VLSM. We added the idea of NAT, network address um, translation. And with NAT came the private address spaces that you see here. The 10 network, the 172.16 network, and the 192.168 network. So those three networks are set aside for private internal use. You don't have to contact IANA and register an address, in other words, or block of addresses. They're free to use by anyone, but they're disallowed on the public internet. So these cannot be used on the public internet. The concept with NAT is that you could have a virtually unlimited number of these privately addressed devices inside your network and they could be hidden from the external internet but the traffic could go in and out by simply replacing the private address on each packet with the public address so in this way a company could get by with one public address for their entire company and that that's what nat does so nat is a process of keeping a table of what's coming in and what's going out so that the packet IP addresses can be removed and replaced. So as they're going out, the private addresses are removed on the source and replaced with the router's public address. On the way back in, the public address is removed and the pri private address is re reapplied to the packet header. So this obviously takes enhanced CPU, a lot of RAM, and it adds to delay. It does conserve the public IPv4 address space, definitely. It saved a lot of addresses, and it is always configured at the border of your network. So this is something we do at what we would call the edge of the network. So that's typically the router that outfaces towards your internet service provider or ISP. Some terminology you'll want to have in your notes with definitions would be what is an inside address, what's an inside local address, an inside global address, what's an outside address, What's an outside local address and an outside global? Three types of NAT. And you don't have to pick just one. You can actually use two or more of these at one time. Uh, static NAT is really doesn't save any public addresses. It's more of a convenience. So if you're going to be using NAT, uh, it's nice to be able to have a privately addressed server publicly available, but you create a one-to-one -one mapping. So you would uh, pay to get a public IP for that server, but it can be inconvenient to get the server in front of the router out on the public internet, especially if your company doesn't have what we would call a DMZ, a demilitarized zone, which is an area in front of your router. So imagine having two routers at the front of your network and a block of public addresses like large enterprises do, but small medium companies don't have that. They have one router like we do in our homes and they have their server, their web server, their email server, their various servers are sitting behind that. So one way to make those appear as if they were in front of the router is to use static NAT. This will bond one-to-one -one and a uh, public IP address to this private address. Can't be used by other devices, only exclusively used by the one device. It's, of course, the fastest is the least overhead. There's really nothing to record in the table because it's always a permanent mapping, a one-to-one -one mapping. Then we move on to dynamic NAT, where you would set aside a pool of public addresses that could be used, kind of like checking out books at a library. Let's say you had seven books. That means the first seven patrons to come to the library and check out that book get it. The eighth patron gets told, I'm sorry, the book's out. Now imagine those books now are IP addresses. If you're the eighth device, you don't get on the internet until one of those IP addresses gets checked back in. So that's not the most popular way to, uh, to do it. Also, um, it, it just really wastes addresses that may just be sitting there, public addresses. 
The most popular form in that is going to be PAT, Port Address Translation, where you can take one IP address, one public address, and overload that with uh, with any number of, there, there's a physical maximum of around 40,000, but pretty much practically speaking, any number of private address devices can all share that one public address. Advantages of NAT, right? We already talked about conserving the dwindling IPv4 address space. It also increases uh, flexibility and it provides consistency for internal network addressing, meaning you get control of the internal addresses. You're not beholden to what addressing you got from your ISP. You can create your own address ranges, which can be very nice. I don't agree with the final one here. I do not believe, and experts in our industry do not believe that NAT affords any kind of network security. So I would strike that. Um, Oddly, Cisco puts this in their uh, curriculum for the for the CCNA, but um, I would take issue with that. All right, disadvantages of NAT. Performance is degraded. As we talked about, it will put an overhead on your router, which slows it down. And if you have an underpowered router, like um, in a home or small network, oftentimes we find that what happens is they connect too many NATed devices so they get a $50 router and they start adding 12, 15, 20, 30 devices behind it and their network goes really slow. And of course, they think it's their internet service provider. They start complaining about the slow internet and possibly even waste their money buying upgraded bandwidth plans when really the problem is their degraded router because it doesn't have the CPU and RAM necessary to maintain that large of a NAT um, address translation table. So keep that in mind. Uh, it is definitely, you can, um, you can minimize the disadvantage of performance degradation by getting a router with a faster CPU and more RAM. End-to-end -end functionality is degraded. So it breaks the, what we call the end-to-end -end connection. You lose visibility from one end to the other. It creates a, a middleman. The NAT translation table becomes uh, as far as you can see. If you're on one side of it, that's as far as you can go. If you're on the other side of it, that's as far as you can go because that packet is manipulated in the middle. You never have the true addressing information of the endpoint. So of course, end-to-end -end IP traceability is lost. You really can't trace route beyond the, the edge router. Tunneling is more complicated, things like VPNs. Now, we can work around all of these just to let you know when we're using the word degraded, we can still make it work. It becomes more complicated. And we call that NAT traversal, which is outside the scope of the curriculum in this chapter. But NAT traversal that we would talk about in like a, one of my Cisco voice classes would talk about how we deal with the reality of NAT. So the reality is NAT is everywhere. Everyone uses it. Everyone's going to keep using it. So we have to just deal with it but we can keep complaining about the disadvantages. Initiating TCP connections can be disrupted, and you'll see why, because when we use PAT, we actually change those TCP um, port numbers. So we modify the port numbers temporarily to keep track of the various um, NAT translations that are going on with PAT. Let's look at configuring NAT. So with static NAT, it's pretty simple. It's one command to configure it, and then, of course, we have two commands, and these commands will apply to all NAT. We always have to apply it to the interfaces. So it's kind of a two-step process. First, you configure it by creating a mapping, which you do here with a single command, IP NAT inside source static, and then you provide the inside local address and the global address, the inside global. So that's your inside local and your inside global. You see that here? And then you have to apply it. You have to tell the router which interface will be the inside interface and which will be the outside. The inside interface is the one with the private IPs and the outside is the one with the public IPs. So then you want to verify it. You can type show IP NAT translations and that will show a permanent entry in the translation table for that private address to that public address because this is a static NAT. It will be a permanent entry in that table. Let's move on to dynamic NAT. Again, this is the least used uh, form of NAT. This is where you can create a pool of public addresses 
and they are doled out to inside devices, privately IP devices, on a first-come, first-served basis until they're gone. So the pool must be large enough to accommodate all inside devices. So again, it doesn't really have a huge savings. I, you know, I, I generally, if I was in a situation with dynamic NAT, I would probably just use static NAT. Um, I would have a fear if I didn't have a public IP for each inside device that it wouldn't work. Perhaps in a day gone by when not all devices inside your network were always accessing the internet, maybe this was more useful. But in today's always on the internet um, economy where every device seems to be communicating to the internet all day long, this is just simply not a very valid way to do it. But we're still going to learn how to do it. It not only is on your Cisco exam and on the exam for this chapter, Creating PAT, which is the one we will use, the one we'll look at next, is only one small change to the steps for this. It's simply adding the word overload at the end of a command. So the commands for this are identical to the commands for PAT. So here's how you do it. You create a pool and you say, okay, these are gonna be the start and end public addresses that, that I have to dole out. And then you create an access list which lists the inside private addresses that are allowed to access this pool, right? So the pool are the, remember back to the analogy of the seven library books, those are those seven library books. And then your access list is stating what patrons are allowed to check out the book. So you can restrict access to those public IPs to certain ranges of your internal private IP space. Then you bind the pool to the access list with that third command there. So create a pool, create an access list, and then the third command connects the pool to the access list. Done. That's how you bake a dynamic NAT. Then, of course, you have to specify the inside and outside interfaces we do with any of the forms of NAT. Of course, use the same show commands. Let's look at PAT. PAT's the most widely used form of NAT out there. You'll notice here that it looks very similar to the way we configured dynamic NAT. You create a pool with a start and an end address. Now, if you want this pool to be one single address, because remember, we're going to overload this, then you go ahead and just put the same address for the start and the end. You know, so whatever your public address is, just list it twice there. And if you want to borrow the address the router is already using, which is even more common, you can do it this way. Notice it's one step shorter to do it this way, right? Instead of having to create a pool and having to create an access list and then connect the pool to the access list, we skip the pool and we just create the access list and then we tell it to overload the router's interface. So we tell it to use or borrow the same IP address the router is already using, so that public IP on the outside of your router. You're going to do all of these in labs. Use the same commands to troubleshoot and verify. Let's talk for a moment about port forwarding. Port forwarding is an interesting way that you can borrow the same IP address multiple times. Remember I said with static NAT, you'd have to have one public IP for each server inside your company. But with port forwarding, you could borrow the same public IP and use it to access different privately addressed servers. You could say, okay, if it comes into the public port on port 80, go to my web server at this private IP. If it comes into my public IP on port 443, send it to my um, secure web server. Or comes in on port 22, send it to my SSH server, that kind of thing. So you can actually get more mileage out of a single public address. You could have several privately addressed servers inside your network sharing the same public address. NAT for IPv6? You bet. It's not necessary to use NAT any longer with IPv6 because remember that NAT was created to solve a problem of depletion of the IPv4 address pool.
Now that we have IPv6 with 340 undecillion addresses, that's really not a problem. So there's really no reason to use NAT, but if you wanted to use NAT, it does exist. It is different in its implementation than for IPv4. Okay. There are still therefore private addresses, which we call site local addresses, um, which my apologies are now called unique local addresses or ULAs. They were originally when IPv6 came out in 2000 called site local, but they've renamed them unique local. So ULAs are designed as essentially private addresses. They're um, only usable within your site, within your organization. And they're for use with, uh, with NAT if you choose to do that. We won't get into that in this chapter because we're restricting ourselves to just NAT for IPv4. One legitimate use for NAT with IPv6 is to bridge IPv4 networks and IPv6 networks. So you could, for instance, have some networks that are IPv4 only and some that are IPv6 only, and you could replace the IPv6 header with an IPv4 header, right? So if you had an internal network, say, that was IPv6 and it needed to access the public IPv4 internet. Say you were, wow, I really want to switch my inside network to IPv6. I want all my Wi-Fi and my phones and my PCs and my printers. I want everything on IPv6 inside our company, but the outside internet is still IPv4. So one way to accomplish that is um, NAT64. And NAT64, 624, sometimes they call it NAT624, is the recommended way that you would connect an IPv6 only network to an IPv4 only network. But that's not the preferred solution. The preferred solution to do this would be what we call dual stacking, where instead of going IPv6 only, they would recommend you keep running IPv4. So add that IPv6 network, absolutely, but leave your IPv4 running as well. So you every device in your network would have two IP addresses, one IPv4 address and one IPv6. Most modern devices, your phones and um, your PCs are already equipped to do this, but many printers, smart televisions, uh, kind of those appliance type devices may not yet be equipped to handle dual address. So you might have to look at NAT64 as a um, temporary transitional solution. All right, let's talk about troubleshooting NAT. Well, one thing that I like to do before I start troubleshooting with those show commands is clear your statistics and translations. And so there's two clear commands for you. That'll remove anything that occurred before. So you're not looking through a bunch of stuff wondering, um, is this really working? Because you might have had NAT translations that were working up until a point. So I like to clear those out so that way if you think NAT's not working or having trouble, if you see anything in those show commands, it's something that you've seen current, right? That's not historical. You can also debug NAT, and uh, the debug will show you all the translations in real time. It will tell you what internal IP is trying to access the external, what external IP it's been assigned temporarily. It goes through the whole thing. So you can follow that conversation back and forth. But as we know with debug, you can generate a lot of messages. And when you're on a production device, it's just really not practical. As we learned in a former chapter, you could debug IP NAT and like put a 100 at the end and that would use an access list to filter that. So you could specify just one or two internal IPs that you wanted to debug. And that would be helpful because you could reduce the um, volume of debug messages you receive. Let's look at the summary of what we've learned. We know how NAT is used to help alleviate the depletion of IPv4 address space. We know NAT's characteristics, some of the terminology like inside local, inside global, outside local, and outside global. We know the general operations of NAT. We know the different types of NAT, static, dynamic, and PAT, or NAT overload. We know the benefits and disadvantages of using NAT. We know the basic configuration, including how to verify um, our NAT configuration. 
we looked at port forwarding and how it can be used to access internal devices from the internet. We looked at the show and debug commands and also the clear command that can be used in troubleshooting NAT configurations. And we briefly talked about how NAT still exists for IPv6 and how it's used quite differently there than it is in the IPv4 address space. Thank you.